just raise your hands right now. So quite a few of you across the room. Yeah, I, I would say a thousand people in our church have been through Rooted. But if you're in the room right now and I can see you and you have not had the chance, you just haven't been through Rooted yet, go ahead and raise your hand if you're in the room and you've not been through Rooted and that's not you. So quite a few of you as well. In fact, I think we would say, I've heard John say probably close to 900 people that would probably call Northside their church home have not yet been through Rooted. And so uh, there's a lot. And that's why today, uh, I just really want to encourage you, as you can see by my Rooted shirt today, to sign up for Rooted if you've not been through it. I want to encourage you with this because it's an incredible experience where you learn about God and you learn about his community, the church, and you learn about your purpose uh, and how God can use you in this life in incredible ways. You'll get a group. Uh, you're going to get a guide, a book that you'll go through and study together. You're going to get some experiences that by the end of this thing, after these 10 weeks, uh, the goal of it really is life transformation. You can be like, man, after 10 weeks of this, uh, wow, I, I, I was this, but in just 10 weeks, I'm, I'm this. I mean, God was already doing that to me. And we've seen that happen. It's a powerful thing to go through. We want to encourage you to do it. You can sign up today. It's $40 to do Rooted. It includes a celebration dinner at the end. We've got scholarships if that's a, a problem for you. But I would encourage you to get in on this. September 7th, it's a Wednesday night at 6.30. John and I are going to be kicking rooted off uh, right here at Northside on a Wednesday night. And then um, the, it ends on Friday, November the 18th at 6 p.m. That's a big celebration dinner where there's baptisms and testimonies and worship. And, and ju it's just an incredible night together uh, that you'll get to be a part of. And then in between that time, uh, you'll meet with your group on the night that works for you and your group to meet, and you'll go through that experience together. And I just want to encourage you, if you've not been through Rooted, uh, this would be a great thing to jump into. Uh, we're kicking off life groups and all that as well. But if you've not been through Rooted, that's probably the thing I'd say, do it first and do it now. And so uh, you can sign up for that on our website. You can go right in our next steps out there, get information about Rooted. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. It's incredible. So I just would love that. And then also, I just want to mention this. Last uh, Sunday, we kicked off this new series because we're in this year of Bible engagement. And we're now reading through the New Testament. You've been in Matthew this week. And as we go through the year of Bible engagement, we kicked off a new series called Do What Jesus Did. And here's something I want to encourage you to do that I don't always encourage in this way. But uh, we're going through a series right now where every sermon builds on. Uh, that is not typically necessarily how we do every series. But if this is one of those series where it really does build on itself. And the reason that's important is because even before 2020, even before COVID, uh, it was said that the average person goes to church 1.8 times a month. 1.8 times. So, I mean, that's not like a lot. And uh, so that was before that. I don't know what it is now. I don't know what it is for our church. I don't know what it is for you. Uh, I don't know what that number exactly is. But here's what I do know is if you're going to miss a week, I really want to encourage you uh, to go to our YouTube channel. You just go to Northside Christian. And if for some reason you're going to be missing a week, I want to encourage you to find time during that week to listen. I mean, obviously, we're streaming live to YouTube right now, and as soon as this service is over, you can go to YouTube and access today's services and listen. So you can just, if you miss a, a Sunday morning, you can start Sunday afternoon, anytime throughout the week. Go to our YouTube channel, uh, listen to that message, because it's going to build. And last week, we were talking about notice the need. We were talking about the 90% of people who are not in churches in our community today, right now. They're not in our churches. And so how are we going to go to them? And last week we had a testimony from Travis Greider that was just so powerful, incredible. And I would love for you to be able to listen to that or, or, and see that testimony as Travis told his story of just going into a, what would, you could call it a, a dark place or you could call it a place where, where the light of Jesus was needed. It's just an incredible story. And I'd love for you to listen to that. It builds towards what we're talking about this week. So I just want to encourage you with that. But today... Here's what I want to challenge you to do today. Today I want to challenge you to grow compassion for people so that you grow a passion for people. My challenge to you today is that you grow compassion for people so that you grow a passion for people. Uh, if you're in the room, if you'll stand with me, I want us to read God's word together. We're going to read this out loud together. So for, this, for the reading of God's word, we're going to stand 
And we're just going to read from this text together. It's Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And we're just going to read from the screens uh, here behind me so that we're all reading the same thing. And, uh, and I, I just want us to read this out loud together and just hear what God has to say to us today. So let's read these four verses together. Here we go. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We began that reading and we said this. Then he saw the crowds. Then he saw the crowds. You can be seated as we talk about that for a moment. Then he saw the crowds. Kyle Eidelman in his book entitled One at a Time, which is a great read. I'd, I'd encourage you to read it if you haven't yet. But he said 40 times in the Gospels, we read these words, Jesus saw, Jesus saw. In fact, the launching of some of the most incredible transformative stories that we read in the Gospels is when Jesus saw, and then what happened next. And right here in Matthew chapter 9, we've got these words. It says, Jesus saw the crowd. Jesus saw the crowd. And then what happened when Jesus saw the crowd? He had compassion for them. He saw the sick. It says, he saw the harassed, the helpless, the lost, those that were like sheep without a shepherd. They were aimless. He saw them. He saw their true state. He saw their true condition. He didn't just see a crowd. He saw the person. He saw the one. He didn't just see the jagged, rough edges. He didn't just see the defenses that people were putting up. He didn't just see their, their jaded emotions. He didn't just see their hardened facade or their hardened hearts. He didn't just see sarcastic remarks or even people reacting with anger in their voice. He didn't just see that. He saw their wounds. He saw their hurt. He saw their need. He saw the person, and he had compassion on them. Kyle, in his book, he said, you know, one of the things he was looking at when he was reading through the Gospels were what were the emotions that Jesus most often felt as he was walking on this earth? And he said, you know, there was a lot of emotions that Jesus felt, whether it was frustration or disgust or exhaustion or joy or anger or loneliness or grief or rejection or dread. I mean, Jesus had all kinds of emotions that we read about when we look at the life of Jesus through the Gospels. But there was one emotion that just seemed to appear, show up more often than the others. It seemed to come up over and over and over again. And it was the emotion of compassion. He had compassion on them. Which is pretty telling in a lot of ways. Because I think for a lot of us, when we look at our emotions, compassion probably isn't the first one that comes to the surface. And the reason for that is we tend to gauge our emotions by what we're going through or what we're experiencing in that moment. Most of our emotions can tend to turn inward and be a little self-centered. A lot of our emotions seem to go that direction, but not for Jesus. Because of his love for people, because of, of what they were going through, Jesus was filled with compassion for people, compassion that led him to action. You know, a lot of times when we think of compassion, I think sometimes we just think, you know, did something make me emotional? You know, if I see a movie or I, I see something play out, you know, did I cry? You know, did I hear someone's story and it touched me deeply where I felt emotional and tears were starting to flow? But when you look at the life of Jesus, it, it's not really the tears or an emotional response that dictates compassion. Compassion was something that he, he did. It, it was something that he acted on. You'll notice, in fact, almost every time you see compassion with Jesus associated with it, there's always a conjunction that follows the compassion. And it's the conjunction and. So rarely do we read Jesus had compassion, period. <laughs> it's usually Jesus had compassion and. There's a conjunction there because there's more. Jesus would respond. Jesus would act. In that moment with compassion, it led him to action. And so he had compassion. And here's some examples like in Matthew chapter 20, verse 34. Jesus had compassion on two blind men. And he touched their eyes. 
Or in Mark 141, Jesus had compassion on a leper and healed him. In Mark 634, Jesus had compassion on people and began feeding them. Or in the text we just read in Mark chapter 9, 35 through 38, Jesus had compassion on people and he commanded his disciples to pray, to pray for them, to ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers so that they could help them know Jesus better. When you look at Jesus' life, it is clear that compassion is not just an emotion. It's an action. It's more than feeling sorry for someone. Compassion is a strong emotion that elicits a physical response. And we're going to do something. And that is the test of genuine compassion. Is when you feel it, do you do something? Is it compassion and is it followed up with something? That's what compassion is. And so if you had compassion, then the next question should be, so you did what? What did you do? I like the way one person defined compassion. It was this way. Compassion is what you do when the tears are dry. Compassion is what you do when the tears are dry. So just crying and saying that was really touching, that's not compassion. Compassion is what you do. How do you respond? In his book, One at a Time, Kyle tells a story of taking his son skiing, which he had already done many times. He knew how this was going to go. So when they got to the top uh, of the mountain and the lift dropped them off up there, uh, Kyle talked to his son, and he said to him, because he knew he was a better skier than, <coughs> than Kyle was, he said to him, um, when we're going down the mountain, he's like, he just reminded him, remember your limits, you know, stay within your limits. You know, don't do anything too dangerous. And uh, I'll meet you at the bottom. It's kind of, and then they'd ride up together. And so sure enough, it's how it happened. They started to ski and phew, his son took off, was heading down the mountain. Kyle's going side to side, being a little more cautious. He was skiing for quite a while and it's a long run down. And when, it, when Kyle got about halfway down the mountain, <coughs> he saw this guy over to his left. And this guy had bit it. I mean, he had wiped out. He had ski poles laying around. His skis were stuck up in the snow. He had gloves laying over here. It was yard sale, like they say, there on the mountain. And, and Kyle was skiing by. Look at this guy like, ooh, you know, that's not good. You know, that guy really wiped out, bit it. And, and, um, and Kyle, you know, it looked like, you know, he's thinking he hope he's okay. But Kyle's like, there's nothing I can do, really. And so Kyle's just kind of looking over there as he skis by. And all of a sudden, in that moment, Kyle realizes uh, that's his son. And Kyle said immediately, his emotions went from sympathy for some guy over there, hope he's okay, to that's my boy. And that's about the time he heard the man over there moaning as he laid in the snow. And so Kyle turns and he skis over there. And uh, there's his son laying there and he's moaning. And he had broken his collarbone and was in need of help. And Kyle immediately started helping, getting his stuff, you know, helped getting him down off that mountain. And uh, Kyle said, when I realized it was my son... I no longer just had sympathy, I had compassion. I, I, was, I was moved to action. I was going to do something to help him, to, to engage. I mean, that's what compassion does. It, it was, it, I'm going to do something for him. I, I was hurting for him in that moment. I didn't just feel bad for him. I was feeling his pain. It was his son. And I think that when we think of God, we need to realize God sees us as his children. I mean, how often is that how God... Re refers to us as his children because when you think of a child, there's this compassion that wells up in you for them. And if we want to see the results that Jesus had, if we want to see the amazing stories that we see in the life of Jesus, we need to do what Jesus did. We need to have compassion for people. And we need to act on their behalf. We need to engage them. We need to see what Jesus saw. We need to see people as his children. That's what will first lead you to have compassion for people. Do you see them as the children of God? And when you see them as children of God, then you've got to go where people are. You've got to go where they are. And so I want us to reread this text. It's up here on the screen. and You don't have to stand this time, but I want us to reread this together out loud. Read it with me again. And I want us to pay attention to where Jesus goes. Because where he goes is maybe what we ought to do as well. So let's read it again. Here we go. Ready? Let's read it together. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 
Where did Jesus go? The text says he went through their towns. He went through their villages. He went into their community. He went to where they lived. That's what Jesus did. He went right where they lived. And the text says when he saw the crowds, he saw their need. He saw that they were hurting. He saw that they were harassed. He saw that they were helpless. He saw their needs. And he was filled with compassion for them. That moved him to action. He didn't just see a need. He was committed to do something about it. He didn't just have an awareness of their lostness. No, he moved relationally toward them to engage them, to help them. Corey Scott, our worship mission and I, we, we were talking about that this week, and we were talking about this message, and we were just visiting about it, and I was telling some of the things I was talking about. And in that, it just came up as part of our conversation because I was saying, you know, a lot of these people, I mean, they're around lost people all the time. I liked how Corey said this. He says, you know what, you know, many of our people, many of you, you, you go to work, you go to school, you go into your community, you're around lost people all day. But just because you're with lost people doesn't mean you're engaging with lost people. Just because you're with them doesn't mean you're engaging in their lostness. Just because you're around them doesn't mean that you're intentionally doing anything that would help them or help them come to see Jesus or come to see how far from God we all really are in our desperate need for Jesus and to have a relationship with them. We have to engage. We've got to engage the lostness of people. We don't just go where lost people are. And when you look at the steps of Jesus, you see him going to where they are, engaging their lostness. And, and when you do, you're going to find a couple different extremes, honestly. You, will, on one hand, find some people that, man, they know they're lost. I mean, there's no doubt. Uh, they're hurting. They're broken. Some have hit rock bottom. And, and when you're visiting with someone like that, man, they know. They know they're lost. They know they're in desperate need of help. They know they, they need help from God. They need help from people. Man, there's, there's an openness there. But they just know. They know it. And then on the other hand, you'll come across people who really are not in tune at all with their lostness. They don't feel lost at all. They think they got it together. And, and from their perspective, they're okay. Some people don't know they're lost until they're found. It's kind of like the young boy that was in a retail store with his mom. And she was shopping. And he was just following her around. And this was going on for quite some time. And she's looking at stuff. He's looking at stuff. Well, at some point, they kind of got separated without knowing it. He's looking at stuff while his mom leaves the store and goes into another store. This was at the mall goes into another store, and she's looking for stuff in there, when at some point in time she realizes, uh, my son is not with me. Meanwhile, he's in the original department store, kind of wandering around, when a manager notices he's not with any adult. And he goes up to the young man and says, hey, how's it going? And, you know, okay. And he's like, hey, do you want to come over here and get something to drink, you know, by my desk over here by my office? And he's like, yeah, that sounded good to the kid. So the manager takes him over there, gets him a little soda while he's sitting there, and just off to the side, kind of where his desk is over there. And this uh, mom, meanwhile, he tells the associates, you know, if you see someone who's missing a kid, I got this kid over here, no parent anywhere in sight. And so... Uh, they're kind of keeping their eyes peeled when this mom comes running into the store looking frantic. Immediately they're like, this is probably her. And uh, can we help you? And she says, you know, I'm looking for my son. What's he look like? It's the same description. It's like, hey, he's right over here in our manager's office. And, and so she goes running over there, tears streaming down her face. She has already imagined the worst case scenarios. Those of you who have children, you've been there, right? It's happened. And so she's running into that office and she bursts through this door right there where her son is. And her son's just sitting there sipping on a soda and sees his mom come into the room, smile on his face. But when he sees the look of terror on his mom's face, immediately the boy started crying. Why did he start crying? Because he really didn't know he was lost until he was found. Until the look of desperation on his mom's face revealed just how lost he was and, and broken he really was. And it was in that moment that he had a, a realization how far from God he was. And if you can still hear me over that, <laughs> It's raining. I really hope your windows are up right now. Um, and I have been sick this week, so it's hard for my voice anyway, so I appreciate our sound man helping me out here. Uh, seeing people as children of God, I mean, this young boy, when you think about losing a child and the lengths you will go to find a child, when you begin to see people as children of God, um, it is in that moment you're going to grow compassion 
for those people. If you would view them that way, it's why when Jesus tells the story of a prodigal son who left his father and went his own way and lived and partied it up, and when that young man hit bottom and came to his senses and was like, what am I doing, and wanted to go back to his father and was still on his way when his father saw him, the text says, Jesus telling the story, the father's God and we're the son. What does he say about the father? He, he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him and he brought him back into the family. He was filled with compassion. It was his son. If we would see people as children of God, it would help us to grow compassion for people. We need to see what Jesus saw and then with compassion be moved to do what Jesus did and act on their behalf. If you have a Bible device, I want you to open up to Luke chapter 5. And the reason we're going there is because uh, this same account is told in Matthew 4. And I know we're reading through Matthew right now, but but Luke 5 gives way more details. This is probably the same account. Matthew 4, Luke 5. There are some commentators that, that think that they may have been two different occasions. There's others that think it's probably the same occasion. I think there's a good chance it was the same occasion. And so I'm going I'm to use Luke 5 to provide some more details. But this is Jesus' call to his disciples to follow him. And I want us to look at this account when Jesus calls them to follow him. And I think some context is helpful as we open up to Luke chapter 5 because... Um, when you open up to that, I just want you to know that when Jesus calls his disciples to follow him, they had already known who he was and in some ways been following him for many months. Some would say nine months. Some would say from the time of Jesus' baptism when John said, look, the Lamb of God takes us in the world is probably a year, maybe a little bit more. Uh, you go to the Gospel of John to see that timeline unfold, and then you come back to Matthew, Mark, and Luke to, to see what happened. And so, in other words, these guys had already seen Jesus baptize, some of them. They had already seen Jesus cleanse the temple, uh, talk to the woman at the well. They had already seen his healings in Judea, him turning the, the water into wine in Cana, doing that, his first miracle. They had followed him around. And, and now we come to Luke chapter 5, verse 4. And I, I want us to start here, just for the sake of time. And here's what we read, where Jesus tells Peter, he says to him, put out into deep water. Take your boat and put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. He comes up to the disciples, comes to Peter, these fishermen, and he says, I I want you to go out to the deep water. I want you to go where the fish are and let down your nets for a catch. I, I want you to trust this process. I want you to do what I commanded. I want you to follow what I say. Do what I tell you to do. And in verse five, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. Master, notice that first. He says, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. I mean, we're fishing where you say to go, and we've been doing it all night. We, we've been doing it when you're supposed to do it. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Last night, nothing. So what's going to be the difference between last night and today? Well, this time Jesus is going to be with them. And this time Peter's obeying a direct command that Jesus told him to do. So this time Jesus is with them. This time he's doing something that Jesus has told him to do. He's being obedient to what Jesus said. I wasn't with you last night, but I'm with you now. I'm the difference maker, Jesus is saying. I mean, how many times have we gone off on our own to try to do this stuff in our own strength, our own power, our own ability, without any reliance upon God, and in so doing, we, with the absence of the power of God, we just fall flat. I mean, nothing happens. We don't see God working because we're not doing it in his strength. But this time, Peter's doing what Jesus told him to do, going where Jesus told him to go. When you obey Jesus, you will see different results. And Peter obviously was thinking, man, this sounds ridiculous. We did this all night. Why would we go now, especially at this time of day? It doesn't make sense, but because you said so. I'm going to go. And how many times have we thought, man, this doesn't seem logical. Why would I talk to that coworker? Why would I be led to help this person who's so far from God? They would never be open to God. Why would they want to hear this? But we just obey. And if we just obey, we'll see different results when Jesus is in it. It may not make sense, but that's why it's called trust. We, we just do what Jesus says. And so Peter says, because you say so, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to go where the fish are. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone, and I'm just going to go to the deep water because Jesus said to go there. Sometimes you don't feel like doing it, but if you just go, if you just go where the fish are, if you just go into the deep, you just might see God do something. 
To me, there was a great example of that this week. I'm, I'm asking Corey and Jesse and Dave to come out here because these guys were meeting this last week on Tuesday and they were here at the church doing that like they do every, every week. And I saw them and I was coming in and said hi to them and then they all took off and then later I got to kind of hear a story about their experience. I feel like it relates to what we're talking about. So I want you just to hear their story and let you guys yeah. tell it. So thanks. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Tuesday, we were getting together uh, that morning like we usually do each week. We were working through this passage, Luke 5. I had already arranged with the guys. I'd reached out to them and said, hey, I'd like us to do a prayer walk um, after uh, our time together. And so we were just going to go out where the fish were. And so uh, Robertson Elementary was the area that we were going to go through and pray. Uh, basically, you just walk around and you're, you're praying. You're asking the Lord to lead you and guide you. And if there are people there that need to be prayed with, then you can approach them and just, you know, hey, can we pray for you? Uh, and so, David, uh, you were not all that crazy about the idea to begin with. No, no. This group that we did actually kind of opened me up a little bit. The idea of praying in front of people that I don't know is kind of scary. But uh, I had read a thing on Facebook um, the week before that lady had put up about quitting doesn't actually stop you from failing. So, like, if you're going to quit something, that doesn't mean that you don't fail. So quitting is actually guaranteeing failure. So I was, we were sitting there talking. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go. So Yeah, well, I mean, and, and you had shared that with us, and I needed that because, honestly, our meeting was running long. And I'm kind of a detail guy. I'm a clock guy. And so, like, I'm looking at my watch going, I'm not sure we're going to have time for this. You know, let's just do it later. Let's do it later. We'll procrastinate. And then David drops this, you know, if you quit kind of thing on me. And so we're like, fine, let's just go. So we went. So we, uh, we parked over by Robertson Elementary School and uh, began to walk. And there were a couple guys that we connected with early on. And, and uh, Jesse was the one to really interact and pray with them. Yeah, we saw two gentlemen, uh, a younger gentleman, probably in his 20s, and an older gentleman uh, out in their yard. Uh, and uh, uh, a very intimidating dog, to say the least. <laughs> And uh, so, but we, 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 we just followed, you know, God's purpose for us there. And we walked over to these gentlemen and they were very receptive to us being there and praying for them. And we learned that the younger gentleman had uh, been struggling with addiction to meth. Uh, he had been uh, clean for a month. Uh, and uh, he wanted us to pray for that. And then the older gentleman uh, wanted us to pray for some relationship issues that he had been having uh, with his girlfriend. Yeah. So we, we pray, Jesse prayed first. I prayed. Even the older gentleman, he prayed as well. And uh, when we were done, um, I was talking to the younger guy about Celebrate Recovery. I said, it's Monday nights. We'd love for you to be a part of that. And he said, that sounds great. I think I would really like to do that. And he goes, the, the, um, do you have any information, like a card or anything like that? And I was like, I don't. No, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I don't have a business card or anything. And um, just didn't have it on me. And so that's when David springs into action, saves the day. Yeah, we got back here. And we went out to the thing that Celebrate Recovery has set up here right outside the doors. And me and Corey kind of went through some of the information, trying to find something that would fit for this guy. And uh, I had some stuff to do in town. So, And I'm from that neighborhood originally. So I ran back over there and met back up with his girlfriend was, was there. We had a good talk. Seemed super excited, but we know what the issue had was he didn't have a ride, and that's where the next yeah. part comes in. Exactly. Yeah, then Jesse springs into action. Yeah, so we got back, and, um, you know, I was pretty quiet the car ride back, and I felt we needed to do something, take this a step further. And uh, we have a shuttle here. And uh, so I talked to Lori Weaver and the leaders of Celebrate Recovery, and uh, we are putting together a shuttle service to get folks from that neighborhood over here for these Monday uh, classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, What's, uh, what's really uh, cool about this is this is a perfect opportunity for a commercial. Monday nights, um, <laughs> we need some drivers, <laughs> and uh, it's a great way that you can serve. Basically, be here 5.30, grab the shuttle, drive down to Robertson Elementary uh, for a pickup. That you don't need a CDL license, and, uh, and then you're, you're heading back to drop people off about 8.30. And if we have enough drivers, we're talking maybe once a month, maybe every other month, something like that. So you can contact the church office and get some more information as we put that uh, ministry together. It matters. It's important. What I really love about this whole story is like we almost didn't do it. Like there was just, you know, that little bit of resistance, like surprise, you do something for the kingdom and you face opposition. Shocker. Everything else is so simple except this. And, um, but I was so grateful that the Lord pushed us and I'm so grateful for these guys and we got to see God move in a powerful way. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. Yeah.
Yeah. Man, I just love that story. I mean, it's a simple story. They just went south of Kearney and parked. They actually were parked really close to a church, uh, probably a church these guys had never gone to. But they went deeper. They went to where the fish were. And just by going into the deep, just God opened up doors to plant seeds and to give opportunity. And what will come of that? We have no idea. Uh, will there be follow through? And is all that going to happen? I don't know what all that's going to look like. But here's what I know. Is that we just, if we go where Jesus tells us to go and do what Jesus tells us to do, and we go into the deep where the fish are, then you start seeing God move and do incredible things. I mean, it, it wasn't that hard. I mean, they nearly died from the dog, but that near-death experience was worth it. And so other than that, it, it, was, it, it was awesome. And I just, I'm just thinking, man, God is probably calling us right now today to go into deep water, deeper water. Man, we've been comfortable right there by the shore, but I think God's calling us to go deeper. And you get to Luke 5, 6 through 7, it says, When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. And when you notice the miraculous catch of fish, that's where it happened. It, hap it happened out there. It happened in the deep. It didn't happen at the shore. It happened where Jesus told them to go. That's where it happened. And so if you really want to see Jesus move in powerful ways, you just got to go there. You got to go where the fish are. Maybe we haven't experienced some of those miracles because we're not going where Jesus told us to go. And I think if maybe there's a, a phrase or something we could walk away from this text with. It might be this one, that God moves in miraculous ways when we go where he tells us to go and we do what he tells us to do. He moves in miraculous ways when we go where he tells us to go and we do what he tells us to do. And sometimes we see workers doing this around the world and we're like, man, it seems like God's moving there in powerful ways. They're just going where God told them to go and doing what God told them to do, but that would happen here too if we did that. There's lots of dark places here. We just go there and we, we just step into the deep where the fish are. We're, we're going to see God move in powerful ways as well. And then we get to verses 8 through 10. It says, when Simon Peter saw this, no, notice what Simon, his reaction here. He fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch <coughs> of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. You'll fish for people. And in this moment, Peter comes to know Jesus for who he really is. Because he begins this by saying, Master, Sir. That's how Jesus, Peter begins this conversation. But by, by the time this event is over, Peter is falling on his knees, bowing down on his face and saying, Lord, Jesus, God, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. He's not only seeing Jesus more clearly for who Jesus really is, but he is seeing himself more clearly for his sinful state in comparison to, who, to the glory and majesty of Jesus. And in that moment, he's just falling down, acknowledging Jesus' lordship because he sees Jesus more clearly. He sees Jesus more clearly, and in this moment, he begins to see people more clearly because he's going to start developing a compassion for people the way Jesus had, where he's not just going to fish for fish, he's going to fish for people. In fact, his whole life commitment is going to change from this occupation of fishing to that of pursuing people. We think we know Jesus, but it's not until we obey that we really come to see Jesus for who he is. It's from this moment on that that image of the ichthus, the fish, became a Christian symbol that they even used as a way to identify who Christians were, ichthus. The, the Greek letters for ichthus, there were five Greek letters, and, and uh, each of those letters stood for the first word of Christ, God, Son, Savior. Christ, God, Son, Savior. And... Uh, Lord. So these were the words that stood for Jesus. And, and we keep reading. We look at Luke 5, 11. It says, so they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and they followed him. They left everything and followed him. Peter leaves behind what was probably the greatest economical material advantage that he had ever had for some time because he's got something better. He's going to follow Jesus who's going to provide for what he needs, who he can trust to do whatever he says he's going to do. And for Peter, he, he believes that that miraculous catch of fish was nothing compared to knowing Jesus as Lord, and he follows him. And I know for all of us today, you know, we're used to going to church and going home and going to small group and going back again next weekend. We're used to hanging around mostly Christians. We're used to the holy huddle. But lost people, 
They won't be reached in numbers that way. And an often repeated principle is to expect the hardest places to yield the greatest results. We got to go into the deep. We got to go where the fish are. We need to pray for people. We need to engage needs. We need to serve people and talk about Jesus. And maybe today, as you begin to think about this a little bit, you can start saying, you know what? What if today, what if today I considered spending one hour this week just praying? Just prayer walking, just going out into the community, going out among the lost and just seeing who God allows to cross my path. And in that moment, just saying to them, hey, I'm just, I'm just praying for people today. As well. Is there anything I could pray for you about? And see what doors God opens in that moment. See what it could lead to. Is there a way to engage them or to serve them, care for them, or talk about Jesus with them? What, what doors open in that moment? We would never know unless we go there. Unless we go to the deep, go to those places where the fish are to see what God is going to do. This may be a great day right now to start praying today for the Holy Spirit to give you discernment so you can evaluate your own life and your own ministry to say, where can I create the margin so that I can go into those places? What is it going to take to reach 315,000 or more, it's more than that, people that are in the Springfield community every single day so that they can know Jesus. They're not pursuing a relationship with Jesus, but how can I help them know Jesus? Which means there's some things we probably need to work through in our own hearts today. We need to be thinking about that. We've already talked about, we've already said, but we need to start inviting the Holy Spirit right now to, to bring these things to our mind like this. Before God can work through you, he needs to work in you. And so right now is a prayer, God, work in me. Work in me to grow. What's he going to grow? Grow compassion for people. So you can grow a passion for people. We need to grow compassion for people so we can grow a passion for people. Grow in us, God, your heart. We need to ask right now, that, because here's what we said. We said compassion is what you do when the tears are dry. And so we need to say, God, what, what do you want me to do? How would you lead me to act to engage people in this community? You know, we also need to remember this. God moves in miraculous ways when we go where he tells us to go and we do what he tells us to do. And so today we just need to say, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? How can I be obedient to this? God, that, and I think maybe one of the ways you can respond right now for this is, is to do what Jesus says we need to do in this text, in Matthew 9, when he's telling us about his compassion and how he went through their towns, through their villages, he went to where they were. What did Jesus do? He said, pray. The solution to this is to, is to pray right now. Pray that God would raise up workers to go into his harvest field. That's you. He wants to use you. In fact, today, one of the things we're going to do is pray, not just for you, we're going to pray for you, but also pray for some of our workers who are going into the harvest field a long ways away. They're going overseas, but we're going to ask Robin Jody to step up here because it's her last Sunday with us. And, and as they do, I just want you to know we're praying for you because here's the fact. The harvest is ready. The workers are few. Hear the Lord of the harvest calling you. The harvest is ready. The workers are few. Hear the Lord of the harvest calling you. And we just need to pray, God, sin workers, sin workers, sin workers. And a good response for you today just be, God, here am I, send me. I want to be a worker. And uh, we want to use this time. Uh, Corey uh, leads our global outreach uh, team, and he's just going to share a couple things and just pray over Rob and Jody today. Right now. Uh, come on in here. As you, uh, maybe you've had a chance to meet Rob and Jody, uh, workers in North Africa, and uh, they've been with us a little bit this summer off and on, visiting family here, visiting family in Joplin, traveling around the country as well to see others. And, and uh, so we're glad that they are here with us today. This is, like Wayne said, their last Sunday before they take off uh, to go back to the country, and uh, we want to lift them up in prayer together. I know they would love to meet you. And so uh, out at our go wall, as you head out of this room, take a left, they'll be there after the service. I know they'd love to connect and love to be encouraged by you. Uh, but we know that prayer is kingdom work. We don't just pray for kingdom work, prayer is kingdom work. And one of the most effective things that we can do to see the kingdom of God come and his will to be done on the earth is to pray. and to Because pr that's what the Lord taught us to do. So let's do that right now. We'll pray together. God, we um, rejoice in this opportunity right now to come alongside of Rob and Jody and their kids. And we pray that your name would be held high. Your name would be held high in their lives and in their ministries. Your name is the highest name. We pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
We pray that uh, you would accomplish what you desire in your way, in your timing, and that they would yield to that at every turn. Would you give them what they need each day? Would you be their supply of strength and wisdom when things are confusing? We pray that you would bring clarity. And when things are mysterious, we pray that you would keep them in awe. Lord, we pray um, that you would bring about a spirit of forgiveness, that you would um, forgive them as they forgive others, and that that would be the difference maker in that culture. That what you do by your spirit through forgiveness, using them to extend forgiveness to others, that would stand out. And Lord, we pray that you would lead them, not into temptation, but you would deliver them and you would lead them according to your will and for your glory. Guard them and protect them for this good work. We send them out in your name. We send them out in your protection. We also send them out in your power that you would do immeasurably more than anything they can ask or imagine according to your power that is at work within them and that you will receive all the glory and all the praise. And we thank you for this partnership with them. Help us to be prayerful. Help us to be mindful that whenever they come to mind, we would just pray right then and there. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Would you champion this good work, church? Cheer them on, okay? They'd love to connect with you. Thank you, guys. Forsyth, if you'd stand to your feet, let's allow this to be a moment of response to what God wants us to do. And there's so many ways we can respond right now. One of those is we can give to the Lord, give Him, giving to Him first as an act of worship today. You can see that on the screen, ways you can do that. There's boxes at the back of the room. But this is also a moment right now, just in a prayerful state as a church, where we're just asking God in this moment to grow our compassion for people. In fact, this song we're gonna sing is a prayer. Everyone needs compassion. The kindness, the forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. You know, let mercy fall on me. He's the hope of nations. I, I will give all my life, I will follow. I will give my life to follow. Shine your light, let the whole world see. Let the whole world sing for the glory of the risen king. We just want this to be a prayer right now. And I just want to say today, if you want to pray with someone today, you need God to grow compassion. If you want to perhaps begin a relationship with Jesus or make a decision to follow the Lord or you perhaps they want to become a member of this church or you need to take a next step of faith, I'm going to be right over here at Decision Point out these double doors. I'd love to meet with you and pray with you right there. But let's respond to what God would have us to do. Let's, let's go into the deep waters. Let's pray for courage. Do not be afraid. Fish for people. Make that your prayer as we sing. I'll meet you right over here.